name is Heather Conley. I'm the Senior Vice President for our Europe and Eurasia work here at CSIS. And we are so delighted to have Wolfgang Munchau. Um, many of you know, as the, if you read the Financial Times, uh, twice a week we get some of Wolfgang's great wisdom on the current challenges, opportunities in, in Europe's uh, economy. Uh, while he's not writing for the FT, he is the founder, co-founder of Eurointelligence.com, uh, which is dedicated to providing information and debate about economics, finance, and politics of the Eurozone. So um, I happened uh, several weeks ago to send Wolfgang an email. I thought, well, you might be in Washington during the spring meetings. And the answer came back, I'll be there. And I said, would you be so kind as to have a conversation with us, help us to sort out so many issues that are going on uh, in the Eurozone? And I was so delighted to uh, have that email that says, sure, let's, let's come and have a chat and to have a conversation. A year ago, Wolfgang was with us here at CSIS. We held a very unique uh, forum in Colonial Williamsburg. We brought together European journalists, government officials, thought leaders with, with American counterparts. And for several days in beautiful Colonial Williamsburg, we wrestled what would the future of Europe look like. Wolfgang was so inspirational and such a thoughtful leader for that. I thought, it's a year later. How did we do? What were some of the predictions uh, that we uh, had? And I'm going to kick off our conversation conversation, uh, of course, with Greece. Uh, and, you know, I, I think uh, Greek fi uh, Finance Minister Varoufakis is also speaking this afternoon as well. But I want to provide you a quote that Wolfgang told us a year ago. Wolfgang said about the Eurozone, the system will hold in the core. Small, flexible economies will stay in the Euro, but it is hard to see Southern Europe staying in the currency without debt forgiveness or economic transfers. Something will have to give. I think we're at the point of something maybe giving in the next several weeks if the Greek government is unable to pay its IMF loans on May the 12th. Wolfgang, help us understand what's going on with Greece, the ECB, the IMF, Berlin, and welcome. We're so delighted that you're here with us. Well, thanks for the invitation. I'm so glad to be back. And, and thanks for putting the one quote, uh, the one forecast that I made that turned out to be correct. Um, it, it's, um, it's, um, uh, it's a, as you said, it's a very confusing situation at the moment. Confusing if you look at the, if you follow it on a day-by-day -day basis and hear what people are saying. This morning you will have read that Tsipras, the Greek prime minister, said that we are very close to a deal which is, um, you know, a, which I believe is not true. Uh, on the contrary, from what I'm hearing here, is that we are actually today further from a deal than we were yesterday, and this is uh, would have been getting worse. The, uh, the, 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 the atmosphere between the camps uh, is getting worse, and you know, we're no longer in a situation where we're no longer making progress, where, but where people start to blame each other, where there's a lot of personal, personal problems between some of the people involved. So the idea that there may be a deal next week, which was the, sort of one of these many deadlines people have given us, that's, that's now off the agenda. Um, and I find it hard to see how we're going to get a deal uh, on the present trajectory. You know, the Greek money will run out. Nobody will know when that is. They're always, we're always given numbers. The, my advice to anybody is not to never to believe any deadlines uh, when it comes to these things. I mean, Greece might have another month, but eventually the money will run out because the payments to the IMF in particular, but also to the ECB later in the summer, are very large. There will come a point when they will not have the money that will be in May, in June, at some point it will happen. But it may not happen next week. So, so one shouldn't sort of panic oneself into thinking that if there isn't a deal by Wednesday that things are over. I don't think the finance ministers and their officials and the, these, you know, the, the Troika or the, the, the successor organization to the Troika, that process will not get us a deal. That, that's kind of too late for that. Um, what will get us a deal, if we get a deal, and I'm, no, I'm now sh no longer sure that we will, uh, what might give us a deal is a last-minute inter political intervention. Um, the, I think the only person who can still deliver a deal, if she wants it, is Angela Merkel. Um, it's not clear that she wants it. So far, uh, she hasn't given any indication that she is willing to turn this into a, a, what she always says, 
Chefsache, meaning, you know, my business, highest level business, European Council business. She's so far said, okay, we're getting involved, we're giving you the general political support, but, you know, we leave the Brussels institutions, the finance ministers and all the other, you know, semi-official meetings like the Euro Working Group and the Economic and Finance Committee and various other quangos type structures in which they in which they all meet. You know, that's where all the, 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 the small print is, is is being decided. And if in the end there is a, a political issue to be resolved, we're gonna be accommodative of that. But we're not gonna, you know, I'm, I, I can't deliver the deal on my, on, my, on my own. That is her position now. And what, is, what has happened and where the Greeks miscalculated is that the Germans by this stage are in a complete majority in the EU. I mean, everybody is against the Greeks. And you know, the, it's not a question of Germany versus Greek, it's about you know, 17 versus one. And, and you know, the, the, German, the, the Germans are not even saying much. The Modelif, the Portuguese, the Spaniards, and the others, the Finns, to make most of the noise. Um, and you know, occasionally the German finance minister says something that's then being reported, but it's, it's, not, it's not a fundamentally German, Germany versus Greek type issue um, at the moment. And, and that, that is what makes it so difficult. And it's very hard at this point to get, to get a deal. Even if, Merkel, even if Merkel at the end said, look, I'm willing to cut a deal, I'm willing to recognize your reforms as, as real, they still have to implement those reforms. And just having a list is not what, what, the, what the Eurozone is asking. It, it, uh, implementation means passing it by parliament. It doesn't mean implementing it on the ground. That's another big hurdle. They've long given up on that. But at least having a law in place, a parliamentary act in place that says, OK, these are the privatizations, labor reforms, whatever, whatever we're talking about, anti-fraud uh, reforms. Uh, but even they have not been implemented. And the impression is that, that the Greek government you know, it's a new government with the people who have, you know, not a lot of administrative experience. There's only been one member of this of the of the government with some sort of previous government experience, but he's older and he's not sort of, you know, he's not, you know, not everybody is, you know, for the kind of, you know, what they're doing at the moment is sort of, you know, full-time work. I mean, they're trying to rescue a country from the brink of bankruptcy it requires a serious administrative, you know, knowledge, act, skills, organization, you know, and when, and when you hear the story that the Greek pri uh, finance ministers couldn't find the loan contract with the IMF because the predecessor had taken it home and had to ask the IMF, uh, you know. For a copy? <laughs> to, for a copy. I mean, then you basically look at the kind of stuff that's going on on the ground, and then you ask yourself, are these the guys who are going to, you know, I mean, we've been talking about parallel currencies and other, I mean, we've been sort of thinking ahead and what could happen. I mean, I'm sure they have too, but, you know, I'm sure they haven't implemented this. Because I think, you know, if you're a finance minister and, or a leader of an administration who implements these things, you would probably not spend much time in conferences. You wouldn't be blogging. And, you know, you'd probably be, you know, sitting under, you know, in your office organizing, you know, asking questions how to, preparing how to, how to, you know, shut the airports on day X when it happens, how to close the borders, how to make sure the money that is there gets from the central bank to the bank. You know, it's a lot of logistics. I mean, you know, a, a parallel currency or an exit from a monetary union is a mind-bogglingly complex issue, even for a well-organized country with a functioning bureaucracy. Um, and, you know, one doesn't get the impression that that serious preparations for this event, possibility of event, is, are taking place. So there is a possibility of a very chaotic uh, accident somewhere down the road, some day when the money runs out, when, you know, when a miscommunication happens, when they think, oh, they get the money from the Eurogroup, but in the end they can't get the money because someone, some small country, can't get the, its parliament to vote on, the, on this thing in time. I mean, these are the things that can happen. And we cannot disperse the money before this is legally and you know, le legislatively um, you know, in, in the dry. So you know, the potential for a very serious accident is, is absolutely massive. In fact, I would think that the accident potential to me is the main, the, the yeah. most likely scenario. Well, one scenario that isn't, oh, 
Yes. You might, you know, you might need to put your, mine. There Hello. You go. If you know what, you thank it you. I appreciate it. I think pulling it up. Yeah, perfect. So perfect. Is better? that better? You want to? Is that better now? Maybe a little loud. Maybe that, we can turn up the. Yeah. Is that better? I maybe have to we'll, speak like this. And, yeah. Or maybe um. both can maybe we'll have you project. Uh, one scenario. I am almost worried that when the money runs out, uh, not even to, to default, but it, what we saw over the last two months was a you know a massive withdrawal from Greek banks. And the scarier this gets, and the closer we get to deadlines imagined or real, that in some ways this can, they're going to trip into this problem, simply the people will vote with getting their money out of the banks. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's right. I mean, the, 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 it's a complicated issue because for, one, for some reason, I mean, if you ask yourself, you know, everyone here in this room and, you know, watching this and they ask yourself, would you have, if you had a bank account in Greece, what would you do? And every foreigner would say, naturally, I would, I would no longer have my money in Greece. <laughs> but if you are Greek in the Eurozone, the question is not so simple because in the Eurozone, it's actually not that simple to open an account in a different country. Mm. Uh, it's easy if you're rich, uh, but for example, if you want to open an account in Germany, you have to have a German address. Now, most people don't have a German address. If you wanted to do an account in Luxembourg, you don't need an ex uh, address in Luxembourg, but you need at least, you know, whatever, half a million or something, which is not the, you know, which is not what sort of your average Greek saver has. And you know, in any case, you need to speak the language, or you need to be able to travel there, and you know, you need to make arrangements. For most people, that's not practical. So, and we have, and you know, just taking money out and sending it, and you can't open bank accounts by the internet. We have a lot of in the eurozone, as you have here, in the United States, you have a lot of anti-money laundering legislation, um, um, which is kind of a, being abused as a kind of a protection protectionism of national banking markets. We've seen a great renationalization of banking in the eurozone. Banking, you know, I've, I've had my own credit card. Uh, I've used a German credit card for many, many years while I was not living in Germany. That's now being being withdrawn from me because the, uh, of anti-money laundering <laughs> laws. German credit cards can now only be used in Germany, and and you have to have national, nationally uh, uh, issued credit cards in order to, uh, you know. In, which, which basically goes fairly much against the, the whole idea of not only of a single market, but if you have a monetary union uh, and you, know, you have a sort of descent into nationalism in banking, that's, that's really a, a, a bad sign. And you know, if we you know, move beyond Greece and you're asking me what, what I'm really worried about the Eurozone, Greece is not the number one, two, or three issue for me in the long run. In the long run, there are much, much more disturbing issues behind, behind this. But talking, talking about Greece and this, and this thing, you know, what is surprising is how little capital flight there has been. I mean, there is mm -hmm. capital flight, and we've seen it. The, the worse the news got, the more it was. But it wasn't panic. It wasn't like a bank run. It was like a slow drain. It's a very slow-moving thing. And, you know, and a lot of people have their savings, not in current accounts, but in savings accounts, which have certain periods of duration. And, you know, and you would take a penalty if you uh, withdrew the money quickly. That's another issue, and people would then have to decide, oh, am I gonna, is, it, is it that bad that I'm gonna take the penalty, or will I, you know, will I not better wait a little bit, or you know, turn my one-year contract into a six-month contract? Others are turning, you know, others are turning their money into, from a, from a bank savings account into gold, or some other asset that they can keep at home or in the safe deposit box. So not all flight out of the banking system is a flight out of the country. So you know it's slightly more complicated. Yeah. But obviously, if the news turns really bad, and if you know if you know if we get, I mean, yesterday there was one news organization reported that the Greek finance minister was having a conversation with one of the you know lawyers who specializes in debt default. You know stories like that, uh, or when there is a huge breakdown in the in the in, in the in the negotiations, when people are saying. We're going to default in 10 days, so we haven't got the money to pay the wages. You know, when these stories kind of, kind of come up, then people may start to, to, to accelerate the process. But I, I, even then, I don't expect, expect that the, you know, I don't think we'll see 50% asset withdrawals. I think you may find 10, 20% of the, of the, of the withdrawals. So it will be an increase that will then be compensated by the ECB. 
uh, increasing the, the, the emergency lending volumes for the Greek banks. So the Greek banks are safe. This is not the bank run that's happening is absolutely not dangerous for the moment because the ECB compensates whatever flows out. Uh, the ECB allows the Greeks to, to borrow through this emergency lending system. So at the moment, it's a perfectly self-stabilizing system. Uh, that, but, but the ELA is a temporary measure. It cannot be sustained indefinitely. Um, but you know, it, it cannot be withdrawn easily because it, because it takes a two-thirds majority to withdraw it. But you know, Greece is not, you know, has, doesn't have many allies. So if the ECB wanted to, it can pretty much pull the plug but the ECB won't pull the plug unless there's political support for pulling the plug, which there isn't at the moment because we're still in a political process. So the political process takes precedent. And whatever it resolves, and if it comes to a point where people say, we've tried everything, we can't keep Greece in the Eurozone anymore, if that were to become the consensus, then the ECB will pull the plug. Or if the consensus is, and as you know, some people, more and more people are talking about that option, that the one that I favor, is for Greece to default, but to stay inside the Eurozone. There are many reasons for that. Uh, why why is, is this less, you know, is, you know it's less uh, damaging to the economy? It's, it's legally better because you know you can't. There is no no system for an exit from the eurozone, and most importantly, is a, an exit from the eurozone. Even though I don't think it would cause contagion, it wouldn't cause a financial meltdown as some people have feared. I think it will be a fairly calm. It would, it would have big imp impacts. I mean, it's not a zero. I mean, lots of companies would go bust, and uh, you know, a lot of things would happen. But uh, for me, the biggest, the biggest issue uh, you know, is, is the way people perceive the Eurozone. The moment they perceive it as a monetary union, when a member state leaves, at that point, they will perceive it as a single currency system, no longer as a monetary union. They will see this as, an, as, a, as a kind of a fixed exchange rate system with a huge exit door where the people share a currency, but it's not the same as a Montreal Union. A Montreal Union is a, a union where people, where member states are not meant to go in and out. I mean, in, yes, but not out. It's not sort of something where you, know, where you enter and leave. It's an entry-only system. Um, and, and that, to me, would, 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 you know, would, change, you know, would change a lot in the, in the, in the I, your, your comment piqued me that Greece was not the three of your biggest worries, so I think maybe Tell me the first one, two, and three, because I'm very worried, obviously, about Greece. So I'd love your comment on that. And then I'd love to switch uh, to the topic of European quantitative easing. Mm -hmm. um, do you believe now, even in these early or very early days, is it successful? Or are you concerned that, his, you know, for the first time, negative interest rates, we are in very uncharted territory here. Is that something that we not only do not understand and its implications for European pension funds, insurance, um, is that something that we actually need to fear? We just don't know what it's going to do. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not worried about negative interest rates. I mean, it's not, I'm not saying they're, they're relevant. What, what's happening, there's a lot of institutions, financial institutions on, on the European continent with unsustainable business models. And the, you know, with unsustainable business models, and these are um, you know, looking at German life insurance companies. And what German life insurance companies do is they promise a guaranteed return to their to their policyholders, and that guarantee is not something that they do voluntarily. It is it is something they have to do by law. So they have to give their policyholders a, a minimum legal guaranteed return, which I think is one point. Uh, I forget the number, 1.3, 1.4 percent, something in that order, but definitely higher than what any return they can get on the market. Uh, so they, that's the reason they're not there. They, they have uh, obviously big portfolios of bonds. These bonds paying higher interest rates for now because these are bonds bought, you know, two, three, four, five years ago, maybe even some even longer. Um, but anything they would buy now wouldn't pay. 1.3 percent. A 10-year German bond is paying at the moment uh, 0.1 percent or 0.14 percent, and you know it won't be long until it will. It too will have a negative yield. That will happen, um, and you know we, we, the whole the whole the whole thing is is going. So if if one you know the, the business model of a certain industry can be changed. Uh, so I'm, that's why I'm not, I'm, I'm not worried about it. I mean, the fact that the business model is not consistent in this environment tells me that we have to change the business model, but the negative interest rates are necessary. And they're not ECB. The negative interest rates are market rates. You know, the market sees in deflation, the market sees or low inflation. 
Um, and that's why very long-term rates have been pushed down to zero. If you look at the markets for inflation products, five-year, five-year forward rates are still the most benign of those various products. But if you look at swap rates, which is the one that I would look at, where people make a direct bet on inflation swap, where people make a direct bet on, on, on inflation over a certain period of time, you know, these, this tells us that on the 10-year level, we are just by 1%. And that's sort of that's the long-term inflation expectation. So for me, you know, the, the ECB's target has kind of dropped from two percent to one percent, and we are sort of kind of struggling to to reach the one percent. But that's still in in, in reach. The two percent is completely out of reach as a, as an inflation target, unless something fundamentally happened that we don't foresee to happen. So you know, QE was necessary. The EU needed needed to do QE just as the way the US needed to do QE, except that in the in the eurozone things are harder. And we do a lot less of it. Uh, things are harder because we started already very late. Uh, we already had price expectations coming off the cliff. They are harder because we don't have a capital markets-based system, but a banking system that funds industry. And so the impact on funding costs for companies is much more indirect in the Eurozone than it is in the United States or in the United Kingdom. The third reason is we don't have much of a housing market funding through mortgages. We have you know, the German systems works doesn't work through mortgages, but through bank loans uh, that have a certain guaranteed structure. These are covered bonds. Um, uh, banks cover, using covered bonds as a backup to these these type of uh, these type of you know, bank based mortgages. So the ECB operations would not affect those those instruments. The interest rates of those instruments. Uh, these are sort of just sort of three very important arguments. And the fourth argument is that we, the ECB's program, is only 6.5% of the outstanding volume of European Eurozone bonds. You know, the uh, US and the UK programs, you know, affected 20 to 30% mm. of the outstanding volumes of. So this is a much, much smaller program. Um, and, and it couldn't have been a lot bigger for political reasons, but also because it's, you know, all these life insurance companies cannot sell. I mean, this is, this, there are a lot of people in the Eurozone who, who sit on these things and cannot let go because the interest rates are too low. So there, there is a less, less round. So most of the sellers of this stuff are foreign central banks, hedge funds, foreign-based, mostly non-Eurozone-based institutions in their majority, which is why the exchange rate effect has been so, so significant, why the dollar-euro rate has been. So it has, it has had an impact on the exchange rate. That's a welcome, you know, a one-off little benefit. That's why the economy is performing better for now. It's not because anything happens on the ground. This is the, we are not, you know, it's not, we're not investing. The, government's, the government position is the same as it was before. You know, this is a, 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 a double, double fillip, the, the, euro, uh, the, the, the oil price and the euro's exchange rate. Uh, the euro on a trade weighted basis is down by 11, 10 to 11%, which is significant. It's not massive, but it's significant. It's a help to some exporters. So it, it provides some relief after a long period of very low growth rates. Um, so it is significant, and it's a good thing. There are dangers that can be, can be resolved. I'm, I'm the least pessimistic about, of the various things about QE. I'm the, that's, that's, that doesn't worry me. There's only sort of one political problem with it, is that because of QE, a lot of people are now saying, um, you know, if Greece leaves, it's going to be fine because we have QE. And I think one has to be very careful about those, those arguments. Um, and, you know, it's being made everywhere. It's, it's made by very respectable people and very respectable institutions. But, you know, you've got to be very careful about that argument. It's true in one, in one level because, yes, I don't think Portugal will be in danger if Greece leaves or when Greece leaves. I don't think that will happen. But Portugal, you know, there are other, other effects that might be happening. And we, we have the QE in place. It would, it would certainly help that. We have a much greater control of the exposures. We know the exposures to Greece. We've calculated. We've had five years to reduce them and to understand them. We understand the credit, the credit default swaps market a lot better today than we did do at the Lehman sky. So we know approximately where the exposures are, where the risks are. So the idea of a financial Armageddon, I, I don't see. There are all sorts of other things. When a country collapses, all sorts of things can happen. I mean, there are, you know, there are companies that go past, and if one company goes past, there may be creditors to that company. There may be follow-on consequences elsewhere. That I can see. So it will not be a non-event. It will be a big event. 
but it won't be a systemic, a systemic rant. But it, it may make people slightly more complacent. And, and if you want to understand why the Europeans are kind of willing to let Greece go, you know, QE is, is a factor in that because they feel a lot more assured through QE than they were before, which is not a reason not to do QE, by the way, but, but it's sort of a side effect one should have. In the mind. other justifications they offer in addition to QE is that, you know, the banking union, they have, you know, the OMT mechanism, the ESFS, there, you know, the last several years there have been some institution building here that will prevent it. Are you, how do you feel that the banking union is half half cooked, uh, can it, and it's been stressed now, the stress test, do you think the European banking sector is ready for some unintended consequences of a Greek exit? Yeah, I mean, there, there's been a lot of selling going on. I, th <laughs> I mean, the, the banking union in the Eurozone, I mean, there, there has been one substantive change, which is the supervisory mechanism. That's an improvement of the thing. The banking union as a whole, we still have no resolution. We should not kid ourselves. There is no resolution, not, not of any macroeconomic. It's the resolution if the manager of a small bank runs away with a till, that's the kind of resolution that we have. But you know, the resolution that we need, you know, if the Greek banking sector collapses, this banking union will not share the risk. This is a Greek government risk. And you know, we don't have a banking union. It's not just because it, it does, it's not in place yet. This is not a banking union. And so my, as I said, my experience of banking is today a lot more national than it was two or three years ago. Um, and it, you know, the ECB, the single supervisory mechanism, certainly on the level of the big banks, may forge some convergence in the, in the long run. But you know, banking is and remains a national, a national business. Uh, the OMT, I don't think exists, frankly. I think the OMT has been a, a, a statement, but it's, it's no, there is no law. There's no legislation for it. It's no, I don't think it will ever be used. I don't think it can be used. You know, for me, the OMT is a, you know, it has, you know, it has done its work. It has, people believe that it exists. It's like a, I called it a, you know, sort of a fairy dust type policy. You know, it's a lot of, you know, ima you know people imagining things. It costs nothing. And, you know, it's sort of a Loch Ness type monster, uh, you know, tourist attraction. It has been, it has been very successful at, at zero cost. But, I mean, it's not something on which you can base a sustainable Strategy. So, if if a an attack, I mean, we don't have, we don't, we are not in a situation where an attack is needed. But if a, if if a country, if say Italy or Spain, were attacked by financial markets, the you know whatever would rescue them, and the ECB may be able to be able to rescue them through or through QE and other mechanisms. It won't be an OMT program. There will not be an OMT. It will there will, will be no time to negotiate it. The conditionality will be just as complicated as it is for Greece today. Uh, uh, so it, it will be very hard to do this type of program. So it, so my, you know, the, the, you know, the EFS, the ESM, obviously exists, but the ESM, we've seen the limits. It's a small country program. It cannot be used for Italy. It could be used for Spain, but there it was only a partial program for the banking sector. It, it was used for a very small recapitalization of the banking sector. So it, it had, you know, it had its uses, but you know, we should not. And now we're seeing how difficult it is in the case of Greece, which needs the money. To, uh, to, uh, to, to do another loan. So one shouldn't take, think of the ES ESM as sort of some kind of you know, easy, easy mechanism to produce, you know, to produce liquidity. So I think the institutions, you know, you know, isn't, I would not characterize us as saying we have the institutional setup to deal with crises. Um, and you know, we have the institutional mechanism to deal maybe with the crisis we had five years ago, mm -hmm. but with the crisis that we are now confronting, you know, the persistent long unemployment, the crisis of financial sector instability, much of which we are seeing, we are seeing now, uh, imbalances. I mean, this is a so subject we haven't discussed yet. Yeah. I mean, Germany is having heading for 8.5 a counter account surplus of 8.5 percent this year, and on my on my estimates, about towards 10 percent in the following years. Wow. These are you know imbalances that you know that that will produce significant distortions in the in the in the in the economy between north and south, in particular. And it will make the South look, lot, look, look a lot less sustainable in the, in the future than it, is, than, than it does today, you know, where everybody just focuses on you know, bond yields and how low the interest rates are, and as though, that must be, you know, as, though, as though this is what makes you sustainable. You know, I'm always telling people of, of sort of anecdotal experiences. When you, you know, I live in, you know, I, I, you know, I have relatives in Germany, but I spend a lot of time. I have a house in Italy. I spend quite a bit of time in Belgium and France. And I live in the UK, so I travel quite a bit through the various European countries. When you go shopping in supermarkets, it's, it's quite stark. You go to a German supermarket, and you know, I'm, you always, I'm always stunned by the number of products in the supermarket, your average supermarket, 
which cost less, less than one euro. You know, if you go to Italy, in a, you know, one of the poorer regions of Italy, you, you know, the price level is higher, uh, as it is in France. And whenever I write this in the newspapers, then I usually get some American readers say, yeah, but the price level in Wichita is lower than it is in New York. But I'm saying it's here the other way around. In, in our case, it's New York's price level would be lower than that in Wichita. If that were to happen, well, how would you explain that? And you know, it's, that's what our situation is. I mean, here's rich Germany having extremely low prices, and poor, poorer countries having higher prices. And the, the prices in the Greek, I haven't been to a Greek supermarket uh, lately, but, but you know, those are apparently, I'm hearing, much, much higher than they are in Germany. And you know, it's real, that's the reason why, why, why these pension, these high, these high Greek pensions that Germans always complain about, they obviously, they're looking at the nominal amounts. Uh, in terms of purchasing power, these pensions are not high. Uh, they would be high if, if the Greeks were, were able to buy in German supermarkets. And it's not only to do with the fact that Germany has some discount, uh, discounters and different retail infrastructures. That's a factor. I, I admit that. The Germans have pioneered all these, these cheap supermarkets with you know, half a percent profit margin. Uh, that's, that's unusual. But uh, uh, you know, it, prices are, are low. You feel the, the, you know, you feel when you know, Germany lives, lives the life of a country with no inflation. And if you go, you know, in, 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 where I am in Italy, you know, the motorway that we're using has a charge, and every year that charge goes up by five percent. Every year, as, you know, this is a, as though it was a human right by that by that by the company that runs that motorway uh, to to raise its price by five percent because they do it because they can because they obviously you can only use that motorway otherwise there's, there is no no real life alternative. But you know, you can see this sort of the mentality of the price increase is still. You know, the, 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 the annual change in your price that is very hard to get out of, out, of, out of a system once you have it in the system. And, you know, and even, even with all this, this disparity going on, you know, German inflation rates remain at the lower end of the Eurozone. And that's still something where you say, how can that be? After all this, I mean, the, you know, Germany should be running a much higher than average inflation rate for, if, for there to be any adjustment happening. But this isn't happening. Germany has lower inflation than Italy. But Italy needs to adjust its price level down. And how can that be? Spain has, low in, has a little lower uh, inflation than Germany. So there is some adjustment happening in Spain. But you know, we're talking 20, 30 years until that, you know, at that rate, until, until, that, until that comes back to balance, if, if, that, if those trends were to persist, which they won't. Wolfgang, as you're looking at the French economy and the Italian economy, what issues concern you the most about both, and what should we be looking for in the future? Where will we see either the, the payoff of some structural reforms, or where politically it's too difficult for these governments to push through very painful reforms? Yeah. I mean, the first thing to, to note about reforms is, is that the impact of reforms, I mean, you know, you know in the typical European conversation is, you know, says one person to the other, you know, I'm about to you know, run out of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm about to go bankrupt tomorrow. And the, the other person says, yeah, but what about structural reforms? <laughs> and you know, these are completely different subjects. And it's, you know, when we're talking about, we know, are we letting Greek go bankrupt because of labor market reforms? Is this really the issue? If you look at Italy, if you look at the impact of economic reforms, by those who favor economic reforms, like the OECD, who has been banging on about economic reforms for, forever. Uh, you know, the impact is not all that big. I mean, you know, if you look at the, the impact of the fiscal austerity, the negative impact of the fiscal austerity, now, no reforms will ever counter that or make up for that. So if he basically hadn't done this austerity stuff, we wouldn't have needed to do the reforms. Uh, you know, we just need to do, just get the scale of these reforms. In we are talking about single-digit percentages, increases of GDP, on those calculations, not on my calculation, but on the, on the calculation of those who favor the reforms, you know, accumulated in a sort of a 10-year period. I mean, we're talking six, seven, eight, depending on what kind of reforms you're, you're making. You know, that would be a level, a level effect in the long run. Um, you know, we've lost that. We've lost more of that through austerity. Uh, the direct impact of stuff that was destroyed, economic activity that was destroyed, that never came back. So, so, so one has to put into perspective the the importance of reform relative to the importance of having a macroeconomic policy that, that is not destructive. Just having a, a macroeconomic 
policy that's not destructive would yield infinitely greater benefits than, uh, than, than all, these, all these reforms together. But yeah, I'm in favor of those reforms because they yield gains. One shouldn't be, you know, one shouldn't be against them if they, if they yield six or seven percent or accumulated over 10 years. You know, fine, I'll have them. Uh, but it's a political thing, it's difficult to do in every country. In France, it's very difficult to do. The French government had to resort to a, an emergency clause under the French constitution that allows it once a year, once in a parliamentary term, to pass a law without approval of the parliament. It's like you know, a, a little present to the president who can pretty much say, I, I, I'm, I'm allowed one thing in a year. <laughs> and you know, he did this, he, he, used, he used this article in the French constitution to bypass the parliament. He can do this in every parliamentary session, which runs from the summer to the summer. So he can do a second stage of reforms in the autumn, in the fall. Um, and he will, they're planning to do a similar thing. So these reforms are coming, coming up slowly. They're small reforms, like you know, opening the shops on, on every other Sunday or, three or six Sundays a year or something. You wouldn't consider that to be huge progress, but it's sort of a step. And this isn't going to raise your GDP at all. It's just, you know, it's, it's nice. It's nice for the people who live there. It's not, it's not something that is important. There have been some, some more important reforms about labor markets and, and pension systems and, and that. But, you know, I'm not that pessimistic on France. I mean, France has persistently outperformed Germany in the, in the, in the, in the Eurozone. Persistently. The French economy has done better than Germany. If you, if you read the newspapers, you think France is some kind of economic basket case, but that is not true. France has persistently, it has, Germany has outperformed France in the last couple of years. There's been, you know, whether that's a trend change or just some cyclical overlap will, will, remains to be seen. But France has had a couple of good quarters again. So, so I think, the, you know, people have written, written off France many times because France didn't reform. And hence people conclude, oh, this country must be a basket case. But in fact, you know, France, the French economy is, you know, it, it is, people are quite educated. They have a good school system. There's some good companies. You know, it's not a weak. It's not a weak country. It's well organized, an incredibly well organized administrative structure. So you know, and a good public sector infrastructure. So this is not a you know, this is not a fundamentally sick country. There are issues about, you know, there are issues. France has more than its fair share of problems. Youth unemployment being its biggest one, and France needs to address those. And you know, that's what I worry about France. I'm much more worried about France exclusion in France, about you know, how, the, how the young people react politically. You see the, the rise of the far right in France. That's the stuff we, we should be worried about. And the loss of French influence. You know, the, um, um, France is playing a politically less important role today than it did five years ago, than, and then that was less important than it was 10 years ago. And if you remember Mitterrand <coughs> call, in the beginning, Mitterrand was the senior partner in that relationship. You know, by the time Chirac was president, he was the junior partner. By the time Sarkozy was the president, he tried to stick to that role, but still measure up to that. And on some issues, there was French leadership. At the present, there is, you know, there's no French leadership. And on the Ukraine, of course, Hollande is there too. He's, you know, he's with Merkel in, in Minsk. But it's not, it's not, you know, one doesn't get the impression that this was Hollande's, you know, Hollande was the, was the most important figure uh, uh, at that table. Um, so you know, this has been a gradual decline. That's where, you, where I'm, I worry more than, than the economy. Now, Italy is, you know, Italy sees some, some recovery and people are very you know, gung-ho about it. Uh, I do not trust in it, it, it Italian recovery quite yet. What you're seeing is essentially, uh, you know, the, 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 what you're seeing is the euro and, 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 and oil price effect. And these are predictable effects because if you're an oil importer and the oil price goes down, you have a benefit. It's a mathematical certainty. And next year, that benefit will be gone because it's, everything will be, will have fallen out of the statistics. It's still cheap, but you know you will not have improved yourself relative to this year. And and, and that's the same with the exchange rate. So my uh, my guess is that most of the exchange rate and and oil price effect is one off unless they generate some kind of dynamic, which I don't see any. I do not see any evidence of that. That there is sort of an internal internal dynamic, and you know, one, you know, Italian banking system is still extremely constrained. Um, the the industry is 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 you know, a lot of damage has been done in the, during the crisis to Italy, Italy's industry. Um, a lot of you know skill has been lost in the Italian economy. It, take, it will take time to rebuild that. And Italy, you know, Italy, in my view, will need to do reforms simply to rebuild confidence. That to me will be the main the main factor. And that's not just 
uh, labor market reform, but more important are judicial reforms, administrative reforms. If you're a businessman trying to set up business in Italy, your main obstacle are administrations and bureaucracies and judges that come basically make life difficult for you. Uh, you know, that, that's, that's, a, that's sort of the thing that people are looking for, for reforms, and that, which we haven't seen much of it yet. Uh, the interesting thing is obviously whether Renzi is going to survive politically. Um, uh, the, the government has, is, they're currently embroiled in a very deep dispute over his political reforms. He wants to reform the electoral system, make it easier for him to win the next election, basically. Uh, uh, um, uh, the idea is basically to give the, the, the um, it's a long story, the, the current system on which, he, not he, but his predecessor was elected, was a system that rewarded the majority party with a premium. So if you were the largest party, you would get a number of seats, uh, but uh, in the lower house. In the upper house was a different electoral system. So we have sort of, you don't, a majority in one house doesn't give you the majority in the other, other house, and both houses can kind of kick you out. The first part of this thing has, has kind of worked. The upper house has kind of been relegated to a, a lower political status. It still has you know, co-decision rights in certain legislation, but it's not, you know, it can no longer uh, uh, place a vote of no confidence in the prime minister. But the second part of the legislation is to, um, is to reform the lower house system, uh, because what happened since the present system was challenged in the Constitutional Court of Italy, and the Constitutional Court reset the system to pure proportional representation. So if, there is, if no electoral law passes, Italy will hold its next election under pure proportional representation. That means, means at the current, if, you know, if the last election were, result were applied, the Renzi's party would have whatever, 33%, the next party would have 30%, the third party would have 25%. So it would basically be you know, a split. No, no one party would have a majority, it would take two parties to have a small majority in the, in the House. And Italy has no tradition of coalition, uh, coalition government, certainly not co no coalition government between large parties. I mean, you, you have at the moment a coalition between Renzi's party and some, some, some smaller groups, uh, but there is no, it's, it's not the kind of coalition that Italy would require. Renzi wants to avoid that situation, and he and Berlusconi together drafted this, 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 this new electoral law Berlusconi has since pulled out of that agreement, so Renzi is alone with his party, but there are a very substantial number of MPs of his party that oppose that new uh, legislation. And uh, it is not clear that he can get it through. I mean, it's possible. You know, he's a very, uh, a very skilled uh, operator, and he may, he may find it. He has said he will not compromise, and he, so far he hasn't. And you know the president or the the, the, lead, the floor leader of the Italian uh, Social Democrats, the Partito Democratico, he resigned uh, yesterday in protest. Uh, and you know the the op opponents are you know it's a large number. They're, they they're, they have very prominent you know, leaders. So this is a very big rebellion, a very big rebellion. It's not clear that he gets through this. If he doesn't get through this, you know. You know, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a bad time for, for, for a big European country to have a crisis right now. So uh, you, you are like, can't they have that crisis until we resolve the Greek situation? But you know, <laughs> life isn't like that. So you know, we may soon, if, if this goes wrong, we may soon have to face another, another, another one. I hope, I think there's a chance that it may, it may not go wrong. Uh, uh, if it goes right, if it goes wrong, it'll be fairly bad. I mean, it, you know, we will have uh, instability in Italy, a lot of the pessimism comes back, and this is a big country. Italy is you know, almost 20% of the Eurozone. That's a big country. That affects the Eurozone. Greece does not affect the Eurozone. It affects it indirectly, but it's, it is tiny. It's like, you know, it's, I would say, Ireland, the whole of Ireland is, is the size of the city of Berlin, and Greece is a little bigger, but not a lot bigger. And it's, you know, these are very small, small economic units that you know, they, they matter. For. Well, you know, in, in, the, in those countries, they matter, obviously, but for the Eurozone, the Eurozone is almost as big as the United States. This is very small. Wonderful. Well, I know our audience has a lot of questions. I'm going to add one before I turn the audience. I, I do want your reflections. You are not uh, British, but you live in London, so I would love your reflections on the upcoming British elections and what that means for Britain's future in Europe. But let me uh, pause here. I'll let you think on that one, and let's take some questions. We have some microphones. Sir Michael, right here, we'll start. 
and we'll begin with thank you. Thanks, Heather. I'm Michael Lee, German Marshall Fund. In the latest uh, edition of the World Economic Outlook, there's a chapter on private uh, investment that uh, broadly indicates that historically private investment has fluctuated with the overall economic climate. In other words, it's not an independent variable that determines the level of growth. Yet the Juncker Commission has made as the central plank of its program 315 billion uh, fund with the claim that we heard again uh, in, in Washington this morning that this can somehow kickstart growth and, uh, and jobs. I mean, quite apart from the high leveraging and the fact that the initial 21 billion is not fresh money, could you comment? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 this, this thing, when, I, when we talked about the institutions that were kind of blown up but don't matter, like the OMT and, the, uh, you know, this is another, another OMT. It's a bit of a, of a sort of a, one of these uh, visionary constructions that, that, that are designed to impress, but they will have very little impact on the, on the ground. Leverage matters. I mean, you know, we can. I mean, we, we we use instruments of modern finance to social, socially good purpose. Fine, this is great. But you know, you do not start with. You can't leverage zero, or you know, leveraging like four billion into four trillion is not possible. And you know, one has to just be be, be realistic about what you what one what one can achieve, um, and uh, you know, and avoid double counting. I mean, you know, you might find in the end something that tells you three hundred fifty billion. That you uh, that you you take away from another pile and put it into your pile and say I've generated 350 billion. Uh, you know this is a lot of the I know the the European Investment Bank always does that. They have saying we all things generate so much investment, but you know go as a small company. If you go to the European Invest Investment Bank for small companies, it works through commercial banks. So you can go to a commercial bank and say. I want a European Investment Bank loan. Said so you can only get this if you fulfill conditions A, B, C, and D. I say, well, I fulfill conditions A, B, C, and D, and what's the loan rate? And they say, whatever, 8%. And you know, if I went to a loan from you, what would be the loan rate? Yeah, the loan rate would be 8%. So basically, you know, it's not that much of a big deal. It may be 8.5%. You know, there, there may be a small, a small benefit from that. But you know, if, the, if, if it weren't for the EIB, you couldn't say that these investments wouldn't take place. Some may not take place. Some mar there are always marginal investments. But this, and that's basically the kind of thing. I cannot see this doing, doing much. And the reason people are not investing is because they, have, they don't see the returns. It's not because there's money there. I mean, it's not that the banking system doesn't generate money. Germany, Germany's banking system is not constrained at the moment. So it, it, you, loans are available, but companies are not taking them up. At least there you would expect to pick up in private sector investment if, fun, if funding was the constraint, but that isn't a constraint. So it's, it's an investment opportunity. So I don't think that the, that the that, that, that the provision of that money would, would, make, would make a big difference. And I agree with the, with the point is that, that, that it's not an independent variable. I mean, I think, the, the, uh, I think if, if you wanted to kickstart it, the government should kickstart it. And if the government started to invest and said, okay, we're doing a big investment program at these rates, it's totally sensible. There are infrastructure programs that need to be, need to be done, urgently done. Schools need to be repaired. It's not even about hiring teachers. It's just repairing windows. You know, it's a very basic stuff, really, you know, repairing potholes on motorways and just making sure things are, you know, look the way they did five years ago. That would already be a lot of investment, uh, you know, and just, and there is a lot of stuff they can do creatively uh, to, to invest their money. I, it, I think it would need to be government-led, the idea that, I know, sort of ideologically, we always love the private sector to do these things, but I mean, fr frankly, if, you, if the private sector is in a whole, uh, it's not going to happen. I mean, it's as simple, simple as that. And the commission is, um, I mean, obviously they wanted, it was his program and he wanted to do it. If you're from the center right and you wanted to say, you know, and saying, I want to make a difference, and, but I want the private sector to make a difference. It's a, very much a political, it, it reflects a political mindset, but I, I think the economic re relevance of that program is, is you, you will not find that when you measure it, you will not get to a number that is statistically different from zero. Wow. <laughs> Let me take two more questions. Wayne, we'll take it, and then we'll go over there. Thank you. Uh, Wayne Mary, the American Foreign Policy Council. There's another European, though, non-Eurozone country that is starting to play the game of chicken on sovereign default, and that is Ukraine, mm -hmm. one of the few countries around that would swap problems with Greece, I think, in a heartbeat. 
Um, and this involves the IMF. It involves, obviously, interests for the United States and, and, uh, and the Eurozone in particular. But since Ukraine is really, uh, speaking bluntly, more Europe's problem than anyone else's uh, when you're talking about finances, uh, I wonder if you could address how you think that may develop. And I would just add on to that sort of the, the Russia effect uh, when you know we see sure. Prime Minister Tsipras in Moscow and uh, Mr. Putin in Budapest, and there's uh, you know the, the influence and impact of Russia. I mean, in, in the scale of things, the. I've said, I haven't start, said anything yet, so I'm, I'm, I'm just... Uh, you I'm may just, just want to pull that <laughs> microphone up and eat it. <laughs> I may. I may. Uh, the Russia... Uh, Merkel has, has made the conclusion that Russia-Ukraine is an infinitely more important issue than Greece. And I, you know, I would agree with that. That's, that's a very sensible, sens sensible thing, thing to say. Greece interferes with that issue in a way that if Greece were to leave the Eurozone, it may, you know, there may be... It would be huge reputational damage to us it would reduce our ability to, you know, it, would may, it may reduce our ability to act, uh, to act on a global level. It may divide us. Putin may be able to exploit this weakness for a moment. So these are issues that, 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 that are interconnected. But, um, but uh, you know, the Ukraine situation is infinitely, infinitely worse for us because, I mean, it's, in many ways, this decides, you know, what kind of union we want to be. I mean, are we going to... You know, are we, are we, do we take an interest in our neighborhood or not? Do we just, are we introvert as we have been for a long time? This has been very much a European thing. Obviously, when you develop like something like the EU, you have to be introvert because you have to, or introspective, let me just say it this way, introspective because you have to you know, look at your own institutions, look, you know, look at a lot of details. But, and, and you know, during that period, you're not an, a, you know, as effective global actor as you, as you could be. But you know the times are gone. We are no longer developing uh, the, the EU anymore. The EU has reached sort of a very mature, a mature stage. And you know there is the question: is are we willing to, willing to um, you know defend defend the, the countries that are uh, obviously inside the EU, but also in our immediate neighbourhood against an aggressor, um, or not? And you know it's it's not clear that we are. Uh, so far, I would say there is a point. Um, you know, so far it has it has worked reasonably well, better than a lot of people uh, expected. The, 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 the sanctions, you know, that you know they were not big, but you know I think their their effect will be very strong in the long run. You know, I'm I'm actually you know if you keep them up, the the, the importance of the sanctions is to have them go running for four or five years. They will make a difference over that period. They will not make a difference in in year one. But you know, for cut, cutting Russian banks off the, the funding for a any kind of investment horizon will, 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 will work. But you know, our ability to help Ukraine isn't, isn't I mean, the, you know, it, would, it wouldn't be, you know, given the size of the EU, it wouldn't break the bank, literally, to, for us to bail out Ukraine completely. We could, we could do this. Uh, but then again, we have our rules, we have our, you know, we, we, are, we are basically, the, although more flexible than, than we are, but we're still a creditor. That's, that's how the, the mindset with which the EU, the EU addresses geopolitical issues. You know, it's the money, it's the trade, it's, it's our relations with Russia, because we don't want to, you know, we want to have sanctions with them, but there, there are significant lobbies in the European business community, not just in Germany, but also in the other countries that, that have relations with Russia and that don't want to jeopardize those relations. And, you know, you see Franca Mogherini who says that, you know, the goal of the sanctions is not to damage the Russian economy. You know, get your head around that stuff. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, we are basically playing this sort of very cautiously. And, and, and you know, the, the question, I mean, you know, I, I would give credit to Merkel that she's pushed this more than we thought possible. And I think she, she is intended to hold it together, and there's a good chance that those sanctions will be renewed for another year. Four or five months ago, there was clearly a, an intention by the southern Europeans in particular to get a coalition together to stop that. But I think there's a reasonable, a reasonable probability now that those, that those sanctions will be, will be renewed um, uh, for another year. And, um, you know, but I'm, I'm not very optimistic that, 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 this sort of, that this sort of European will to, to stand up to Putin is strong enough to to get Ukraine to a position that it can prosper again 
and become a member of the EU at one point, because I don't think that's the intention. I think the intention of the EU is to keep the Ukraine out. Uh, I don't think, you know, I, in fact, I don't think we will have any more enlargement from now on. I think enlargement is finished for a very long time to come after because of all these problems that we have internally. Uh, you know, we, we, we will struggle not to reduce rather than to enlarge at the moment. The reduction is the problem. Not the okay, if we have a question, what time for one more? Maybe we sneak, if we answer very quickly, I don't want to hold anybody over, but this is such a good conversation. I don't want to end it, so. <clears throat> Sir, yes, please. Yes, um, I enjoy reading your articles in the FT. Since most of the foreign debt today is actually held by, I think, the sovereign, the European governments, I think you know, a lot of it's moved from private sector to public, what's not to help Greece set up a 50, 75 year amortization schedule of debt and low interest? Because uh, you know, they clearly have these cash flow needs within the next several years, but basically addressing how the United States did with the European countries paying back war reparations. Um, just putting this, you know, restructure the debt to take with the immediacy, it gives Europe some time to figure out some of these problems. Yeah, that wouldn't work because, I mean, it would, if, if the problem were, you know, the, 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 the official debt is actually not the problem because the official debt will not be serviced until 20, 2023. So the Greece isn't repaying anything to the ESM and the EFSF. These, these funds are, you know, free basically for now. This is money, There's, they, will, they won't service it for, for then. That can be and should be prolonged. It will be prolonged. I mean, that, that will be the least the Eurozone will do. It will probably not be repaid at all. So prolonged will be kind of a nice, a good option from, from the creditor's point of view. Uh, so yeah, low, low interest rates, or, or more likely, the term will be pushed to 200 years, the interest rate to whatever, zero. And then you, know, you, you, have, a, you, know, you have essentially the same as a default except that it will look differently in the accounts and it will be presented differently and it will, it will obviously it won't be zero, it won't be some other number, but it will be effectively the same. So, you know, that will, that will kind of solve that problem. And if, as long as that piece of credit is not kind of counted towards Greek debt to GDP, which it needs to be reduced and has all other implications, like having to run a primary surplus of 4% in order to get that debt down as well. You know, if you can kind of exclude that sort of chunk of debt, it can lie can lie there as a sort of a, a separate piece of, of debt that's going to be repaid over a 200 year period or whatever number you, you want to, you choose. You choose. Um, the problem for Greece is the stuff, the money owed to the ECB and to the IMF. And that's money that it needs to serve, service now. Um, you know, there has been a bad debt repayment to the IMF, but there are now constant debt repayments to the IMF in the next few months. This continues now. Uh, and the IMF is not an institution you can default on easily. Uh, you can delay a payment for months or two, but it's not, it's not a, def you know, this is, this is you know, you, you, and the, ES, the ECB cannot negotiate a default for, for legal reasons. Um, you know, its legal interpretation of its own statutes and of European law is that a, the, if the ECB were to enter into any debt negotiations, that would, that would constitute a debt monetization. So, you know, the ECB can be defaulted on, of course. There's nothing the ECB can do if Greece defaulted on the ECB. But uh, the ECB can take a complete loss, but it can't negotiate a 50% loss. So, you know, it, you say economically that makes no sense, but the legal position is that one, one act would be, would be interpreted differently than the other. Therefore, the Greek, the, you know, the, 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 the Greece would have the choice to default on the ECB. Uh, or, or maybe for us to find some other way out of this dilemma. And uh, nobody's come up with a solution yet. We're going to take the world's fastest question, sir. A microphone is coming your way, and then we'll let you go, Volkan. Tom O'Donnell. Uh, I'm, I'm here as a fellow at the AICGS, uh, actually looking at some of these, but for energy angle. I, okay, to make it a focused question, uh, it's about German leadership in Europe, which, like the ECFR in, uh, in Europe says, there's an index that say they've got it. But it's, everybody says it's by default. When I look at the economic front, I just was listening to Herr Schäuble across the street, um, completely out of step with the idea of having um, quantitative easing. You, you were saying they should spend on infrastructure completely against this. Uh, you know, it just seems ideologically really in a different place than it seems need, they need to be. And on the question of confronting uh, Russia and so forth, there's this idea, it seems to have sleepwalked into this, and we're just there for economic reasons, we didn't intend anything geostrategic, and when you actually talk to people, they said, no, no, it wasn't about geopolitics. Well, of course, Mr. Putin thinks differently. What happens if Mr. Putin decides to double the area he's got now? 
uh, what's what they're going to do, double sanctions. So I'm just, I guess what I'm asking you is, what do you see happening with German leadership? Is there going to be a trans, some kind of transformation in, in how to grapple with its new position in the, in the Union? I mean, the, the increase of German leadership has been gradual, uh, but one shouldn't, uh, you, know, when, when, you know, first of all, the Germans don't want leadership in, the, sort of in this American definition of leadership. I mean, you can't do it in Europe. I mean, there, there's leadership that you apply inside the European Council. Now, that's a different thing than the national leadership of us having a bilateral with Putin and I want the others to do the same thing. Now, the way Merkel exercises her leadership is through the European Council. That is the institution that matters. In, you know, and, but it's a debate. It's an open debate. There are, there are 20, uh, 29 leaders in there who are debating, uh, you know, debating, and there has to be a consensus built around a certain position. So you, know, you have to be good. I mean, you have to be persuasive. It's not just because Germany says yes, then everyone will, will, will do it. And previous German chances didn't have quite so much pull as she has now. She's been quite successful at coalition building. Kohl was quite successful at that as well um, in his, in his uh, later years in particular. Um, so, uh, um, and, and you know, the notion of geostrategic, I mean, everyone in Washington talks about geostrategic things, and you think, think it, everybody thinks it, and that's not the case in Germany. There are maybe, you know, if you go to conferences there and you may, you might, you might meet the 10 Germans who think the way you do, but, uh, you know, that's not very typical of the way, of the way this works. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, the idea, you know, you have commercial relationships, that's to them matters. I mean, you know, their companies, companies matter a lot more relative to the political, you know, establishment. And if the companies wanted, and, you know, the, it was a big deal for Germany's companies. I mean, there is a, an organization called the Eastern Committee of the German Industry which is about as powerful as the National Rifle Association in the United States, and about as sort of, you know, benign. And, um, and, and you, know, they, you know, they are the guys who, you know, they are the guys with Putin. I mean, they obviously, they do business with him. They've been investing in them, and that has stopped. And Merkel got these guys to support her policy. That was quite, a, quite, a, you know, quite, quite an act. But, I mean, they thought, perhaps erroneously, and I think probably erroneously, that those sanctions would, 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 would end. They would be, would be gone by now. And they had kind of miscalculated. And they're kind of in a difficult position because they will have to break with her at one point. And that's going to be interesting to see. And that's, that's a difficulty. But on, on leadership, I would not expect this leadership to this, you know, in the way that is understood here. We will not see that kind of leadership. And that's, what we, that's also in the Eurozone. You know, Germany has a, obviously a voice. But you know, the minute Germany exercises leadership, you don't like it because you have a different idea of what, what you want. I mean, you want Germany exercising the leadership that it has to do the policies that you want. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Well, of course we do. That's exactly how we want it. Uh, Wolfgang, this has been a delightful hour plus. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your insights. I have to say, I now have this new vision of a Tinkerbell sprinkling her pixie dust over the Juncker plan and <laughs> OMT and ESM. I think I have a new mental vision for that. Well, we're going to follow this story, and uh, I hope you'll come back next year when I can quote some of your most quotable sayings from this conversation to see whether you were right or whether you were wrong, but you are always insightful and very thought-provoking. So please join me in thanking Wolfgang Wunschow.